Okay, so welcome everyone. I uh, just want to mention up front that this, of course, is a continuation of the Sadie and Henry Bayer Chumash class, which is sponsored by the family of Sadie and, uh, and Henry Bayer. We're very grateful to honor their memory uh, by doing some learning uh, tonight and every Tuesday, or just about every Tuesday at uh, eight o'clock. We've been setting the commentaries, and tonight I want to turn our attention to uh, Reb Meir Simcha of Dvinsk and his commentary, which affectionately is known as the Mesha Chachma. So I want to spend some time uh, giving you a flavor for who this man uh, for who this man was. And then in the second half of the class tonight, I want to spend some time actually learning some of, uh, of what the Mesha Chachma wrote. Um, again, just to give you a, a taste, a flavor for what, uh, for what the Mesha Chachma is, uh, is all about. Okay, so Reb Meir Simcha of, uh, of Dvinsk wasn't born in Dvinsk. Uh, he was born in 1843 in a tiny, uh, in a tiny village. Uh, I'm sure I'm not pronouncing it right, but it's in present day Lithuania in Butrimonis. Okay, so the map, uh, you know, sometimes we've had very complicated maps depending on, uh, on who we've discussed. Um, in, uh, in the case of the uh, in the case of the Meshachachma, the map is is a simple map because he lived for most of his life in uh, in just a couple of locations. Okay, so here's Butrimonis, something uh, something like that. You can see it's not far from Vilna, not far from Kaunas, which is present day present day Kaunas, what we knew in uh, in Yiddish as uh, as Kavna. Um, Butrimonis, I'll just say in passing. Uh, you know, at the time of the Holocaust, which is the last time any Jew lived in that city that we know of, there were around 800 Jews. Uh, they were uh, executed uh, summarily by uh, the uh, Nazi collaborators in uh, in this uh, in this region, of which there were many. Uh, and the only reason that we have any record of of how it happened, you know, every little shtetl was, you know, the Jews were lined up and, and gunned down. There was one survivor. Um, he didn't survive the war. He just survived this execution. He wrote a letter that someone found in the archive at Yad Vashem. It, he later died. So there were a total of zero survivors from the Holocaust from the the Mayor Simcha's uh, hometown. Okay, so he spent some time in his uh, in his childhood in this uh, in this little uh, in this little village. Um, and then he moves to Bialystok, which, as you can see, is not uh, not too far away. And uh, in Bialystok, he uh, he studies and and he spends um, more than twenty years in uh, in Bialystok. At the age of seventeen, he married, um, and he married a woman named uh, Chaya Makovsky, um, who uh, was the daughter of a of a merchant. Uh, Mayor Simchov Davinsk was himself the child of uh, wealthy, uh, wealthy parents. Um, and Chaya was the, uh, was the breadwinner in the family. Um, she opened a business which enabled her husband to continue his, uh, to continue his uh, studies. Um, and I don't think we have a, a text which affirms this, but it's reputed that she used to quote the Pasuk from last week's Parsha, uh, which said, Kol ben ha-yilud ha-yora tashlichuhu v'chol abas techayun. What's the relevance of that pasuk, right? So literally, it means that you know Paro was throwing all the male children into the uh, into the sea. So no, the the male children should be thrown into the sea of Talmud, and v'chol abas techayun, and the and the woman should support. The husband. Okay, so her husband was learning, and you know I didn't say it; she said it. Okay, so the husband was uh, was learning, and she was and she was uh, uh, supporting him. Um, the Malbim had uh, a tragic life from a family uh, from a family perspective. He had only one uh, one daughter. She married, um, and uh, uh, both she and her husband, in their twenties, uh, tragically died, and um, uh, with no uh, with no children. So there are no descendants of the of the Meshachach. Okay. So in uh, in eighteen in eighteen. Uh, let me find the right. Uh, let me find the right year. Um, let's think. Uh, just trying to do the math for a second. Meshachachma was the rabbi in Devinsk for 37 years, and he died in uh, in 1926, 39 years rather. So that would have put him in Devinsk beginning in let's say 1889 or uh, 1887 uh, rather, or there uh, or thereabouts. 
1887, he moves to Dvinsk. Uh, Let me just share the screen. And again, if not for Mayor Simcha of Dvinsk, you probably, I don't know about you, I wouldn't have heard of Dvinsk. You know, there's jokes about the train from Minsk to Pinsk, and Dvinsk didn't, uh, somehow didn't make, the, uh, didn't make the jokes. So let me talk for a minute about uh, Dvinsk. Again, you could see it, it, it didn't even really make the map. Okay, it's in present day Latvia. It's not even close to Riga, right? You can name one city in, in, in Latvia, right? It's not even close to the big city in, uh, in Riga, uh, the big city in Latvia, which of course is, uh, is Riga. But let me talk for a minute about, uh, about Dvinsk. Um, at the beginning of World War I, in let's say around 1914, uh, the best guess is that there were around 56,000 Jews in, uh, in Dvinsk. Okay. That's a pretty sizable, that's a pretty sizable uh, Jewish community. About half of the city's residents were Jewish. So uh, it's not just a little enclave, but, but a, sizable, a sizable portion of the population. They think about half the population was, uh, uh, was Jewish. Okay, so who lived in, uh, in, in uh, Dvinsk? There were about 40 shuls in Dvinsk. And in a lot of ways, it was a kind of microcosm of, uh, of everything that was going on in Central and Eastern Europe at this, uh, at this time. Okay, so you have Bundists and you have Zionists and you have Hasidim and you have Misnagdim. It's a kibbutz galius. They're all, they're all in, they're all in, uh, in Dvinsk. Okay. So I put up this, uh, I put up this picture. Um, you could just put it in the chat. So I said, who are, you know, the rabbis of Dvinsk? So, you know, obviously one of them you can guess is the, is the Mesha Chachma. The picture on the right is the picture of uh, Meir Simcha. And who is the other rabbi of Dvinsk, the man on the left? Anyone want to venture a guess? Anyone have it? So that is a picture of the rugged Shavar Gon, of Yosef Rosen. So among the religious Jews in Dvinsk, you know, they were functionally two communities. There was the Hasidic community and there was the not Hasidic community, you know, they would call it at the time the Misnagdic uh, community. Okay. So the rugged Shavar is the rabbi of the Hasidic community. Um, you wouldn't know it from the picture, he's a Lubavitcher. Okay. Um, he actually was a Chabad, uh, Chabad Hasid. Not a Lubavitcher Rebbe, but that was his uh, Hasidist, that was his background from Kapust. And Mayor Simcha was the, uh, was the rabbi of the non-Hasidic uh, community. So just, I want to pause for a second just to say a couple words about the Rakhid um, because um, he's such an, amazing, uh, such an amazing person. He didn't, you know, I don't think he wrote a commentary to the Torah, so he doesn't qualify for this, uh, for this course. But you can't talk about Dvinsk without talking about uh, the Rugged Shover in addition to Mayor Simcha. They were there concurrently uh, for almost, uh, I think, let's say around 30 years, they overlapped in, uh, in, in Dvinsk. Okay, so I just want to say a couple words about the, uh, about the Rugged Shover. So why they call him the Rugged Shover Gone? Because uh, he was a genius. He was uh, he was uh, a genius. I'll just say a couple of uh, a couple of quick uh, a couple of quick anecdotes. Um, there's one uh, there's one uh, story that goes like uh, that goes like this. There was a young student who said that he um, uh, used to study daily with the uh, with the rugged shover, and he said one day the rugged shover told him that uh, Nachman Bialik, okay, another famous uh, famous Jew from uh, from Dvinsk, Rav Nach, uh, Nachman Bialik had come to visit him and they had discussed uh, various, uh, various matters and the rugged shover gave him a copy of his book the Tzaf Nas Paneach, at which point Bialik left. This is Bialik later wrote that from the mind of the rugged shover could be carved two Einsteins. Legend has it that when the rugged shover heard this statement, he said, and from the leftover specks, one could create numerous Bialiks. Okay, so uh, he had a very sharp, uh, he had a very sharp uh, tongue and uh, a very fiery, uh, fiery personality. Um, you know, there's another legend about him. Uh, uh, someone uh, once told him an uh, idea, a chiddish they had in the Gemara, and he said, wow, that's really something. That should be published in the Tosfos in Erevin. He gave the daf, and, um, and he thought nothing of it. And the citation that he gave 
Vame Vinyavin was this one picture of a cow coming out of a barn in a Tosfos in, uh, in Shas. So he gave that citation. He said, like, that's where, that's where this comment, uh, that's where this comment belonged. Okay, so that was the uh, that was the rugged shover. He didn't get along with everyone, but somehow he and Mayor Simchatzvins got along uh, famously. And you know, even though they were in different camps and the Hasidim, the Zmagdim, like sometimes thought they had a uh, a beautiful uh, a beautiful relationship. Um, let me say a couple more a uh, couple more words about uh, Mayor Simcha's time in uh, in Dvinsk. Again, to to fill in a little of the picture of some of the issues that you know made him famous and made him. Uh, who he uh, made him who he was. Um, in 19, uh, 1906, uh, he was offered the position of chief rabbi of uh, Jerusalem. I believe 1906 is the year in which Rub um, Shmuel Salant uh, passed away. Shmuel Salant had been the Ashkenazic chief rabbi of, uh, of Jerusalem. And um, uh, when he passed away, they, they wrote to Mayor Simcha and asked him if he would take the position. Mayor Simcha was very uh, devoted to his community in Dvinsk, and he was offered numerous positions, um, but chief rabbi of, of Jerusalem, and he said, he said, no, no, thank you, I decline. But it wasn't just that he, uh, it wasn't just that he declined. The, the lay leadership of Dvinsk wrote back to Jerusalem and scolded them. And we have the letter, and I'll just give you a little excerpt from the letter. It says, we of the Russian Gola okay, in the city of Dvinsk rise up in response to the report that the sons of Jerusalem wish to take away our master, our teacher, Mayor Simcha. Not only will they destroy us, but the entire Gola, right? The entire diaspora for whom he is the teacher and the respondent for all who seek the word of God. So you could ask all you want, but he's not going anywhere. And he was very devoted to his community of, uh, of Dvinsk. He served for almost 40 years and ended up, he died in Riga because he was seeking medical treatment, but he lived his entire, uh, his entire life as the rabbi, as the rabbi of, uh, of Dvinsk. In 1907, I just wanna flag this story. It's a fascinating uh, chapter in Jewish history that everyone should know, and you know, we'll have another opportunity to explore it more, uh, more fully. Um, in 19, uh, 1906, a man called Shlomo Friedlander um, published missing tractates of the Talmud Yerushalmi. So Shas is composed of the tractates of the Mishnah. On many tractates of the Mishnah, we have Gemara. Sometimes we have a Gemara a Talmud Bavli. Sometimes we have a Talmud Yerushalmi. Sometimes we have both. And sometimes we have neither. And um, 1906 suddenly appeared, I think it was four tractates of, uh, of the Yerushalmi in, uh, in Kajim, very obscure, uh, obscure topics, obscure Gemaras. And um, uh, it took the world by, uh, by storm. And you have to remember that this is a period when, you know, this is happening. The Cairo Geniza, right, was being pieced back together by, uh, you know, Solomon Schechter and other, uh, and other scholars. Some, uh, scholars like Solomon Buber were creating critical editions of the, of the Tosefta, you know, based on manuscripts, right, this was, this was what was going on in the world. So um, everyone was, was taken aback. Wow, I mean, these, these, no one's heard of them, no one's seen them, uh, you know, maybe ever or for a thousand years, whatever the case may be, here they are. This could be transformative, and um, and and people were people were taken, including right the Gedolei Hador. Uh, some say the Chafetz Chaim uh, was was totally taken by this Solomon Schechter and uh, um, Solomon uh, Solomon Buber, all all taken. And uh, after a little time, you know, it started to uh, it started to raise some eyebrows, and a number of a uh, number of very wise Jewish leaders says said we're a little suspicious. We're not so sure this is the uh, this is the real deal. And a couple of a uh, couple of people tried to uh, to blow the cover off of this uh, off the the story and prove that this was a forgery. Okay, and both the rugged shover and Rameir Simcha, right, jumped on this bandwagon and said, no way, no how, we can prove to you that this is in fact uh, just made up and not, and, not the real, uh, and not the real thing. 
extraordinary, by the way. You know, sometimes somebody writes like a page of Gemara and they say, you know, for Purim or something. It's, it's one thing to write a page of Gemara. It's another thing to write four tractates. I mean, it's, it's mind blowing to think that someone had this capacity, right? You have to know all of Shas to be able to, and this is how they spent their time, you know, making up, making up a Talmud Yerushalmi to, uh, uh, to make a book. Okay, it's a fascinating, uh, fascinating story. And obviously you had to be, you had to be uh, quite, uh, quite proficient in, uh, you know, Talmudic, uh, Talmudic uh, learning to be able to tell the difference between a forgery that fooled almost everyone um, and uh, and what was actually what was actually the real uh, the real deal. Meir Simcha was um, not a Zionist per se because most of the Zionists he knew were secular Zionists and he couldn't sort of sign his name to uh, a secular Zionist movement. But he was a great lover of uh, he was a great lover of Israel, and um, uh, we sort of have it on record that uh, at the, the Balfour Declaration, he said was like a, a life-altering uh, life altering event. Um, and the three oaths, you know, there's a Gemara at the end of Ksuvos, the Satmar Hasidim like to say, based on that Agadita at the end of the Gemara, there's three oaths. One of them is you can't uh, send the, the, the wall until Mashiach comes. So Mayor Simcha said, you know, once the, once the Balfour Declaration was signed, the three oaths are abrogated and you can go back and everyone, everyone can go back to Israel. So, you know, he certainly supported Jews who were living there and, uh, and believed very much in, uh, um, in the land, again, without throwing his hat into the ring of political, uh, political Zionism at the, uh, uh, at the time. Okay, I wanna just share with you one final uh, story, then maybe I'll pause for a couple questions, and then I wanna look at some texts that the Meshachachma, that the Meshachachma uh, authored. Okay, so if you turn to your source sheets, um, you have this in, uh, in source number one. Um, I'll just uh, share with you a, uh, a newspaper clipping from April 29th, 19, 1922. Okay, uh, let me see if I can pull it up, uh, if I can pull it up here. Um, okay, so is this, uh, is this coming up? April 22nd, 19, uh, 1922. This is the end of, uh, of Mayor Simcha's uh, life. You know, this is four years before his passing in 19, uh, 1926. I'm sorry if this is a little, uh, a little short. I, I, I tried to keep the whole uh, page just to give you a sense because I think it's fascinating to see the advertisements from the newspapers almost exactly 100 years ago. The story that we're not looking at, you know, attempted pogrom at Smolensk confirmed by Soviet organ. Uh, fascinating to look at these uh, newspapers. So let's learn a little, uh, a little Jewish history. Uh, to relieve Dvinsk flood victims, Riga, JTA, still going. Jewish Telegraphic Agency correspondent who's just returned from a visit to Dvinsk. Quite the visit. He went to Dvinsk, Vitebsk, and Plotsk which had been inundated by the flood when the river Dvina, that's why it's called Dvinsk, by the way, Dvina, because uh, there's a river Dvina that flows through it, overflowed its banks. The distress of the population in those places is acute, particularly among the Jews. The water rising at times to a level of 35 feet has reached the second floors of moderately tall buildings. It has overflowed a radius of 10 versts, carrying downstream the wooden bridges and roofs of many houses. The authorities are cooperating with the JDC. By the way, I did the math. This is even before TED. The authorities are cooperating uh, with the Joint Distribution Committee um, in organizing relief for the sufferers. The exact number of the drowned has not been ascertained. Some of the streets at Plutsk are still underwater, as are the villages of Droya and Presnovka. So there's this huge uh, flood in 19, uh, in 1922. I have a picture of, I found somewhere online of, you know, like in the aftermath of the flood. So these are like the streets of the city. This wasn't the river, this is the street, right? And they're, they're rowing through the streets of the, uh, the city. Okay, so why do I mention this? I'm not in the habit of telling, uh, you know, like hagiographic hey, stories, but there's one I wanna share with you and I'll tell you why in a second. So here's the hagiographic hey story, okay? It's from a book, and this is like 10,000 points. If you can name the author of this book, okay? In English, it's called, I don't, it's not been translated, but if you were trying to find the security and democracy, 
Kratia. Okay. So I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but I wanted to put it here because I wanted you to know that it's not, uh, it's not apocryphal. This is a story by a uh, former resident of Dvinsk. In 1922, he was 10 years old and his family had just uh, moved there, I think from Vitebsk. He went on to make, uh, to make Aliyah and to a, career in, uh, to a career in Israel. And he writes the following, uh, the following story. He says, there was this, uh, this, this terrible flood. I'm just gonna summarize it here. If you wanna follow, we're the bottom of the, the right-hand uh, right column. Okay. Right. So it wasn't just like it rained a lot, but all the snow is starting. It's April, so all the snow is starting to melt, and uh, and it's just not good for anybody because it's starting to flood. It's starting to flood the uh, the whole community. Okay. And uh, the the flood waters are rising, and nobody knows what to do. It's uh, it's terrible. And it's Shabbos morning, and my family has to make a decision. Are we going to stay home and wait it out, or are we going to go to shul? And uh, this, you know, dad decided we're going to shul. I went with him. So we got to shul, top of the, uh, the left-hand uh, left column. And what happened when we got to, uh, uh, when we got to shul? Okay. Lebasof, yeslit, lemeher, lebet knesset, vanit, staraftila. My dad went to shul. I went with him. And then in the um, in the middle of uh, in the middle of Tfila, in the middle of uh, davening, you know, there was like this uh, this thunder and this great uh, terror, and everyone was uh, was running scared, and everyone ran out of the shul. And Reb Meir uh, Simcha got up. He put on you know he kept on his talis. He walked out of the shul and he walked over to the dam. Uh, that, uh, you know, the Dvina River, and everyone follows them. Can you imagine the scene, the shul in Dvinsk, all the Jews pouring out, following, uh, following Rumeir Simcha in the, middle of, uh, in the middle of davening. And he gets up and he offers a communal tefillah that the, you know, rain should stop and the melting should stop and the waters should recede and the flooding should stop. And he says, and, and it just happened. Like he offered up this tefillah and then, and then the flood, the flood stopped. And he, he said, word got out right away. And, uh, you know, the, the Gentiles, uh, you know, you heard about this and they were, uh, uh, they were stunned. And he says, I remember it. I remember it like it happened, uh, like it happened yesterday. I have it captured in my mind's eye. This, this story. Right? Word got out. Everyone knew, everyone heard that Reb Meir Simcha was some kind of miracle worker. The Gentiles, including anti Semitism, they came out to see that the, that the flood was, was over. But he wasn't a Hasidic rabbi. He was a misnagid. He didn't say, I'm a holy man. I'm a miracle worker. He didn't want any of that. He's like, I'm just a davener. Okay. So miraculous, uh, miraculous story. Sounds like it's straight out of an art scroll book. I share it with you because the author of that story, anyone want to guess? You can put it in the chat if you have a uh, if you have a guess. It's not guessable. the The author of that story is Isser Harel, of all people. Isser Harel, you got it. Isser Harel went on to be head of the Mossad, responsible directly for the capture of Adolf Eichmann, a resident of Dvinsk, and not, to my knowledge, anything close to an observant Jew, right? He's not working for Art Scroll, right? He's working for the Mossad, okay? So, I mean, it was not, it's not like he owed some debt of gratitude to uh, the traditional Jewish community and wanted to write a hagiographic account of Reb Meir Simcha Dvinsk from his church. He's just telling it like he remembered it, okay? So uh, there's other accounts of this, uh, of this story um, and, uh, and I just share it because, right, it's, uh, it's just amazing to think you know, who was in Dvinsk in, 19, uh, in 1922 
all of these uh, all of these worlds colliding and all of these worlds coming uh, coming together. Uh, and Rameir Simcha was was a holy was a holy person, whether he whether he claimed to be or uh, or not. Okay, so Rameir Simcha uh, wrote the Meshech Chachma when he was a kid. He was basically uh, written, I think, almost completed. They say by the time he was uh, he was eighteen. And uh, you know he went back and added or you know uh, uh, amended uh, over the course of his uh, over the course of his lifetime, um, and the legend is that his father didn't want him to publish it as his first sefer because um, he didn't want his son to get a reputation for being like a, you know a darshan. He's a serious uh, he's a serious lamdan. He wanted him to be known as a serious uh, as a serious thinker. So his first published book, um, the other name by which he's known, is the Or Sameach. Took me a while to figure this out, but Or Sameach is a play on, on the name Meir Simcha, right? Or Meir Simcha, right? Um, uh, Sameach. So um, Meir Simcha wrote the book, the uh, the Or Sameach, which is uh, an indispensable commentary on the uh, on the Rambam. Very, very uh, erudite. Very, very learned. Um, it's still used used all the time in uh, you know any base medrash you go into anyone's learning the Rambam. So uh, you want to understand the Rambam on a deeper level, you open up the uh, the Or Sameach. Um, many people refer to Meir Simcha as the, the Or Sameach. Uh, there's a yeshiva named in his honor called Or Sameach. It's all from it's all from Meir Simcha of uh, of Davids. Um, I'll just uh, share with you one more comment, and then I'll pause for any uh, for any questions. One other sort of Historical uh, note that that people always uh, that people always cite when they talk about the Meshachachma is um, is a line he wrote in the Tochacha in Bechu Kosai. I didn't put it on the source sheet. I'll just uh, give it to you in the uh, in the English. You know, he's born in 1843. I think did I say he's born in 18 um, uh, born in 18 where did I put his, uh, his dates, yeah, born in 1843. So he was writing this, you know, 1860, you know, something, um, many years before, uh, before the rise of, uh, of Nazi Germany. But, uh, you know, this was so eerie that, that he wrote such a thing and he left this world in the 1920s. So he, he never saw this, but he said the Jew in general will forget his origin and think of himself as a new citizen who will leave the study of his own religion to study languages not his own He'll think Berlin is Jerusalem, and a stormy wind will come, uproot him by the trunk, and place him in a foreign nation whose language he has not learned. Okay. So, you know, prescient words for people who who became too complacent and too comfortable and too assimilated and too a culture and and on and on. Um, and it, you know, he wasn't saying he wasn't saying it to scare people. He was saying it because he thought that's what pasuk that's what the pasuk meant. Um, and you know he left this world again in the 1920s before he could see this uh, before he could see this happen, but a very prescient uh, prediction by the uh, by the Meshacha. Okay, so let me pause here for a second. Um, I'm going to ask anyone who wants to um, unmute themselves. Hopefully, I can give you that ability. Let me see if I can figure out how to do that. Um, and uh, if there are any uh, questions or comments. Questions or comments, or you can just put them in the chat. If that's uh, if that's easy. What was, what was he involved in po the politics of the day, or good, or you know, and so forth, or he did just stayed out of that? Uh, it's a great, uh, it's a great question. Um, he was nominally um, involved. Um, so there's a famous story, which I apologize, I didn't have time to research, so I didn't want to bring it up because uh, I don't feel like I know enough to, uh, um, to, to share it. I'll just give you the, the headline, which is that he did appear at a, um, at a rabbinic conference in St. Petersburg in 19, uh, 1910. Uh, you know, there was some um, call for rabbis to opine on something, whether anyone was going to listen was an open question. Um, and, uh, you know, he got into some big fight with the Chavetz Chaim. Because the Chavetz Chaim was uh, was like an arch traditionalist, and Mayor Simchutzvinsk was a traditionalist, but not as archly traditional. And they had some dispute over whether or not you could 
speak the language of the land. So, so again, I apologize that I, I, I'm not prepared to give you the synopsis of that story, but there are a few snippets like that where, um, where Mayor Simcha did get involved in, uh, in the politics of the day. Okay, so let's turn now to the text of the Meshachachma um, itself, um, which is which is fascinating. I'll say just one more quick word um, as a kind of way of introduction to the uh, to the text of the Meshachachma, because um, there's a personal uh, there's a personal connection. Uh, the Meshachachma was published posthumously. Um, the year after, he never published it in his lifetime. He had it, he sat on it, never published it. And then the year after, uh, the year after he died, there was a rabbi in Riga, you know, who obviously knew the Meshachma by reputation and published his, uh, and published his text. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't put this up before. That's the forged Yerushalmi on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, spitting image. On the left-hand side of the screen, so this is the first edition of the, of the Meshachma published in Riga in 19, uh, 1927. Um, and you know, I don't know how popular it was when it uh, when it came out. Obviously, twelve years after it came out, the the Holocaust and you know Jewish life kind of uh, kind of came to a standstill as far as uh, academic Jewish life and yeshiva Jewish life and uh, and so on. Um, but uh, some years uh, some years after that, I think around uh, forty or maybe fifty years after nineteen twenty seven, a man called Rabbi Yehuda Cooperman republished the Meshachachma with uh, an amazing introduction and uh, re reformulated into you know beautiful block letters and annotated with with sources and with uh, and with uh, and with notes. Rabbi Huda Cooperman was the dean and founder of, of Michala, uh, the Jerusalem College for Women, and uh, he was a dear family friend of my uh, of my grandparents. Whenever he would visit Los Angeles, he would always stay at my grandmother's house. And you know, so I've fond, um, fond uh, childhood memories of uh, of time with uh, with uh, Rav Cooperman and Rabbanit uh, Cooperman in Israel. My year in Israel and uh, yeshiva. Sometimes I would spend uh, a Shabbos with them. Um, and he once uh, he once said, you know, when I found the Meshachachma, he was uh, a mes mitzvah. I think that was his uh, his formulation. It's like you know, nobody was learning him. Uh, you know, he'd been forgotten about. Uh, he was published in Rashi letters in the back of the basin. Nobody's nobody's picking him up, and so he considered it, uh, you know, a, a, a special schus, a special merit that he was able to republish the uh, to republish the Meshachma. And now he's a household name among people who take uh, Parshanut seriously and people who uh, care deeply about the. The layers of of meaning when they learn uh, when they learn Chumash, and that was thanks to uh, to Rav Cooperman's um, uh, really extraordinary edition. It's the definitive edition of the uh, of the Meshachach. Okay, so um, you know the Meshachachma is um, is an amazing uh, is an amazing work. It's a very deep uh, it's a very deep work, and it's hard to uh, pinpoint or categorize. You know, some of the other works that we've studied, so it's very easy to say, ah, the Malbim's big agenda was to uh, create, uh, you know, reasonable and rational uh, polemics and arguments against the masculine who were, you know, reading the text in a very different, uh, in a very different way. Uh, simple agenda, here's how we executed it, this was his plan. So, you know, who was the Meshachachma writing for and what was his agenda? So those are big. Uh, those are big uh, questions. I'm not prepared to. Uh, I'm not prepared to answer them. But I am prepared to give you a couple of samples of what the Meshachachma does, and and hopefully at least give you a, a, on the surface some uh, impression of of the depth, the breadth, uh, the brilliance, and the lyricism of the uh, of the Meshachachma. One of, the, one of the outstanding qualities of the Meshachachma was his capacity to integrate and combine all worlds. So, you know, he wasn't just uh, interested in Pshat. He was interested in Pshat, and he was also a master of Midrashic commentary. And he wasn't just a rationalist. He was a rationalist who was also a Kabbalist. And when Kabbalah mattered, he introduced Kabbalah. 
Um, you know, a lot of Parshanim were, were great and careful readers of, of the, the Torah's text. And, you know, they knew the Medrash and they knew, he was a master Talmudist, right? He knew Shas backwards and forwards. He knew the Talmud Bavli backwards and the Talmud Yerushalmi back. He quotes the Yerushalmi all the time, you know, more than anyone. Um, and he um, and he knew the Rambam, you know, backwards and forth. So there's this amazing kind of integ integration of halacha, philosophy, parshanut. It's all it's all in here, um, and it's um, it's very deep. And you know, I was just listening to a shir uh, last week. Um, it was the, the title of the shir was like Meshachachma and Parshas, you know, whatever it was Shemos or something. And it was an hour long shir, and it was on it was on one paragraph of the Meshach. So we could spend you know, the whole night on one paragraph of the Meshach Achman. Of course, that's a different uh, different style. So this is too ambitious. I think I put on your source sheet seven, eight, nine, ten, you know, excerpts from the Meshach Um, And, you know, we'll maybe look at a couple of them um, in the original and a couple of them I'll, uh, I'll summarize to give you a sense of what he's, uh, of what he's doing. So um, let me just start because it's Parshas Va'era. Let me start with um, one excerpt from our uh, from our parsha. If you look at Parag Vav, the opening we we'll pick up in the middle, but the opening chapter of, uh, of Parsha Sva'ira, there's a few strange things that uh, that happen. So the first strange thing is that you have uh, is that you have a lineage, right? We uh, were introduced to Moshe and Aaron, but rather than just being introduced to Moshe and Aaron, the Torah gives us. The whole, uh, the whole um, genealogy of Ruvain and Shimon and then Levi, and then uh, we branch off once we get to Levi, so then you could know who the parents of Moshe, um, the grandparents and parents of Moshe and Aaron are. So there's a big question there. Like, what, what are we doing with, uh, with Shimon and Levi? Just uh, Ruvain, Shimon, start with, start with Levi, we, we got it. And there's another question which is a bizarre pasuk. I'm sorry I didn't put it in the source sheet if you have it in front of you. Um, it's source number three. The, the Meshach quotes the pasuk. This is Perak Vav Pasuk Yud Gimel, where the Torah says, Hashem says to Moshe, Vayitzavem el b'nei Yisrael vel paro, melech mitzrayim lo tzies b'nei Yisrael meretz mitzrayim. You can't read that pasuk. It's not readable. It doesn't make any sense. Command the Jewish people and paro to free the Jewish people. You could command Paro to free the Jewish, but what does that mean? What are you commanding? What are you commanding B'nai Yisrael? What, what's the command? They're just, Paro is going to say go, and then they'll go. What, what are you commanding the, the Israelites? So, and again, we spend the whole time just piecing this together. It's an amazing, uh, amazing explanation. He strings together, you know, Talmudic and Midrashic uh, sources to make the following argument. He says, this isn't widely known. There's, you know, a lot of people think that it was just the, the tribe of Levi that was not enslaved in Egypt. This is not true. There were actually three tribes that were not enslaved in Egypt. Okay. And, and again, he pieces it together based on the sources. He says, my, my hypothesis is that, because the, there's a measure that says there are three tribes that were not enslaved. My hypothesis is the three tribes are not just Levi, but also Ruvain and Shimon. And Ruvain and Shimon and Levi are, you know, of a, uh, of a piece. They're all the tribes that in Yaakov's brachos don't really get brachos. They get something kind of other than a bracha. And they themselves, the Meshachma says, had slaves. Wow. They themselves had slaves. And then there's an explicit Yerushalmi, which... It's like very difficult to understand. Meshachma puts it in context. The, the Yerushalmi says, I'll tell you the meaning of this Pasuk. What does it mean that Paro and the Jewish people were commanded to free the Jewish people? The Yerushalmi says, it's the same command. Paro was commanded to free the Jewish slaves and the Jews were commanded to free the Jewish slaves. Really? The Jews were? Meshachma says, yes. There were Jews who had slaves in Egypt and they are now being required they are now being commanded to free, to free their slaves. There's a whole other, I wasn't going to get into, I'll just mention, but because Meshachma doesn't say it, but there's a, a fascinating like psychological side to this explanation, which is right, the, 
the abused too often can fall into the trap of becoming an abuser. So to make sure this doesn't happen, right? First command is before you even leave Egypt, if any of you have slaves, we're done with that. You have to free your slaves before you can go anywhere. So piecing together all these different sources into a coherent narrative makes these sukkim readable. Okay, point number, point number one. Point number two, and I hope I can do this, uh, do this justice. It, it's a little subtle. And tell me if, if this isn't clear, and I'll try to, uh, to flesh it out uh, further. What, uh, what I want to say, and we'll look at this text uh, in, in the original. What I want to say is the, uh, is the following. Sometimes, and I don't know anyone else who really does this, sometimes the Meshachachma actually functions like the Gemara itself. Sometimes the Mesh Chachma actually functions like the Gemara itself, which is to say, he will identify how the shot in the Pasuk actually gives rise to a specific halacha. Okay, that's what the Gemara does all the time. The Pasuk says, and here's how you know that that means you should wear a black box on your head, and that's called to okay. And it pieces it, you know, pieces it together. So sometimes the Meshachachma identifies a gap where the Gemara is silent on a particular issue. And he says, implicitly or explicitly, I will fill in the gap because I will tell you what the Pasuk, what the Pasuk means. Okay, so let's look at this one together. If you have the source sheet, it's source number, it's source number four. So again, if you have a chumash, it's even better. I'm sorry, I didn't, uh, I didn't uh, put all these psukim in, uh, into the source sheet. But, um, but if you go to, uh, to Parshas Pinchas, to Perak, uh, to Perak Chavtes, you go to Parshas Pinchas, Perak Chavtes. So these are all, we know these, uh, we know these psukim because we always lane them. It's always the maftir for a particular, for a particular yantif. And we always are coming back to, uh, to Pinchas because all of the, the korbanos are in Pinchas, the special korban musa for, you name it, right, for Pesach, it's in Pinchas, and the special korban musa for Shemini Yatzer. So we get that from Parshas, uh, from Parshas Pinchas. So the Mesh Chachma says, I want to ask you a question. He says, if you look at the psukim closely, you'll notice there's, there's an anomaly. He says, source number four, Bechago sem chag l'ashem shivas yamim. He says, you're going to celebrate this holiday for seven days. He says, lo kasav kan besukos teshvu, kemosh kasav matzos yachel. So, bapesach uh, Rosh Hashanah yom trua yelachem. Every other holiday gets identified by its defining feature, and then we, we get the carbon. So, Pesach is, you know, the mitzvah of eating matzah, and Rosh Hashanah is the mitzvah of blowing the shofar. But when it comes to sukkis, it's absent. It's just missing. It doesn't say you'll sit, meaning there's, there's sukkim in other places in the Torah, in, in Emor and so on, where you, you have these, but when it gets referenced here, sukkis doesn't follow the pattern. He says, why? Mishum de b'chag hayu tzrichim kulam lahera os lifne Hashem b'shilo o b'beis ha'olamim. And now he starts to piece everything together using uh, his you know, breadth of knowledge of all halacha. So he says, just wait one second. He says, on the three pilgrimage holidays, what had to happen? Everyone was supposed to go to the Makom HaMikdash, wherever that was, you know, until there was uh, Jerusalem, until there was a temple. So the Mishkan was in Shiloh, and then there was David and Melech brought the Mishkan to Jerusalem, and Shlom Melech built the base of Mikdash, and then the Mishkan was in Jerusalem. So wherever you're, you're all regel, you go, to visit the Mishkan, you go to visit the Mishkan on the Shalosh Regalim, on Pesach, Shavuos, and Sukkot. V'chi ya'alu kulam, az p'turim midin hochi drachim, u'mishum mitzayar, u'p'turim isuka. L'chein lo hizkir zeh. Now he imports the halacha that's known because the Gemara derived these halachos which is a special halacha that says, you have to dwell in a sukkah unless you can't dwell in a sukkah. 
And then there's classes of people who are exempt from dwelling in a sukkah, right? If someone's too hot, if someone's too cold, someone's too uncomfortable, the Torah doesn't say that, but the Gemara does say that. So the Meshach says there's some people who don't actually dwell in a sukkah because they're exempt. And one of those categories is if you are a traveler, if you find a sukkah, but technically speaking, you are exempt. So he says all the people are not supposed to be sitting in a sukkah on sukkahs in real life in temple times. It's an amazing thought. He says because they're out on the road. They're heading to Jerusalem. So the overwhelming majority of Jews, right? This is so creative and so original. The overwhelming majority of Jews, you know, are, are being olalaregal and they're exempt from sukkah. So it doesn't say it in the pasuk because it's actually, for most people, not required. And then he says, "Vilai some chachamim lase." He says, and and maybe, and maybe it's the opposite. Maybe this is the basis for the notion that all those people I mentioned a moment ago, the traveler and the mitzvah, that all those people are exempt from sitting in the sukkah. It's so brilliant, right? He, he actually derived what we take for granted the Gemara from others from the pasuk, right? That no one else could, no one else could arrive at this conclusion. Tell me if that was clear or if that was too, if that was too nuanced. Well, raise your hand, chat, something. You can unmute yourself. Okay, hopefully it made enough sense to at least give you, a, again, just a flavor for what the Meshach Chachma was capable of. Okay, in the interest of time, I just want to summarize a few of my other, I want to say, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, like my favorite pieces from the Meshach Chachma. Rabbi, a question? Yes, please, Vicky. I, I don't I didn't quite catch the whole piece because if if it's Ola Regal on Sukkot is a chiyuv so to speak, yes. then why didn't everybody time it so that they would be there to be in in a sukkah? I mean, why do you get a pass for that? So he would tell you that if you're not at home, we we don't really pask in this way, but there is this stream of thought in in rabbinic thing. If you're not home, that makes you a traveler. And if you're a traveler, right, right, which everyone accepts, means that you have to sit in the sukkah the way that you would sit in your house. So you should have nice furniture and you should have your fancy china. When you you know go on a family trip, so you don't have your chairs and you don't have your chair. You, you rough it, you know, whatever, maybe you stay in a hotel, maybe you get an Airbnb, whatever it is, but it's not like your house anymore because all bets are off, you're not home. So there's no expectation that you would replicate that experience with it because sukkah it replicates the home. So one <laughs> home, there's nothing to talk about. Does that make doesn't, sense? Doesn't that relate to the Osek Mitzvah, Potter Mitzvah, that uh, whole uh, sukkah area? Yeah, yeah. So it opens up a whole uh, a whole can of worms. Um, and obviously, look, he's the only one in the world who's making this uh, who's making this claim. But the originality and the creativity is is what I'm you know trying to to communicate more than you know the specific conclusion, which again you could accept or or reject. Let me give you a couple of highlights. Some of my uh, some of my favorite pieces from the Meshach. Why why Moshe break the luchos? Easy one. Sixty-four thousand dollar question. It's like, what you can tell me? He lost his temper. Uh, he was trying to prove something. Why did he do it? Nash Chachma says, "I'll tell you why he did it." He did it for the following reason. He did it because the Jewish people made a fundamental error. This is source number five. It's a long, long piece, a long essay. I just have a couple excerpts here. He said the Jewish people made a fundamental mistake about what holiness means. And he said, the Jewish people made the golden calf. And that revealed to Moshe this fundamental error. The Jewish people believed that holiness could inhere in things. He said, it's not true. That is an error. And again, this is super creative and super original. It's an error. There's no such thing as a holy thing. The only thing that is holy is Hashem. If someone 
imitates Hashem, if someone follows God's commands, they could achieve a level of holiness. That's where holiness comes from. He says, if I would have come down with these luchos given to me by Hashem, best case scenario, they trash the golden calf and they start worshiping the, the luchos. Because I could not have otherwise disabused them of this terrible misunderstanding. They think a thing could be holy. So the, the, like they'll bow down to whatever the thing is. And if the thing is from, they're for sure going to think it's holy. And I want them to know that I could take the luchos given to me by Hashem, inscribed by Hashem itself, shatter them on the ground to, to make it clear once and forevermore. Doesn't work that way. You think that the holiest thing? Nope. Don't fall into that trap. It's a trap, and you're never going to get out of it if you start to, to think things are holy. You start worshiping them, and that's going to take you down a terrible road, as we know from you know, various episodes in Jewish history. So Moshe says, I'm going to shatter the Luchos. I'm going to teach you once and for all. You want to be holy. You follow the mitzvos, and that's what achieves holiness in this world. And th there's no other thing that can be, that can be holy. Again, you can spend hours on this uh, on this thesis, profound and and original and earth shattering. You know, forgive the uh, forgive the pun. Um, there's a lot in the Meshachachma uh, that reveals a kind of, um, for lack of a better term, a moral intuition, a moral intuition which again is, is its own topic. I actually think it's a very important and, and very provocative topic. The sense that once you are immersed in, in Torah and, and Halacha and rabbinic sources, you can develop this sense of, of what the Torah is, is after, of what the Torah is after. And so things that grate against that grain, you, you'll just feel them like intuitively. It'll be like, the, the halacha, it can't be that. It, that. it doesn't, right? And we just have to figure out why that is. Again, you can't do that. If you're a, a, a lay person, you can't do that unless you are, right? The God of you can't do that unless you're Mayor Simcha. Once you've achieved that level, so you have this, this intuition. So for instance, for instance, whenever slavery comes up, it always, it always rubs him the wrong way. So he, he rereads, right, that episode, that episode toward the end of Sefer Beratius where, where Yaakov ends up, not Yaakov, Yosef ends up basically enslaving all of, all of the Egyptians. We kind of gloss over that because it's much less interesting than the relational narratives, you know, between Yosef and the brother. But he's got this whole economic you know, plan where people have to sell themselves into servitude to buy food and the government ends up, you know, collecting all the land and only the priests preserve their land, but everybody else. Has... So the Meshachach says, he's like, you could just feel he's so bothered by this. In source number six, he says, Ulam Yosef sana me'odes kinyana abdus liyos shalit adam ba'adam l'rawa. He said it pained Yosef, this whole notion that a person could be owned by another person. It pained him, it pained him. And so he did whatever he could to buy up the land, but not the, right? And he could, again, look at source number six, but just to give you a, a sense for what, for what the Meshachachma was, uh, was after when it came to this sense of, uh, of, moral, of moral intuition. Um, I'll give you one other example, um, which, um, which I think is like, is the shot. And I have it for you in source number, uh, source number seven. So whenever you get up to the seventh day of uh, the seventh day of Pesach, so what happened on the seventh day of Pesach? On the seventh day of Pesach, we got to Yamsuf, right, and uh, and that's our laning for the for the seventh day of uh, for the seventh day of Pesach, and uh, and, and that's a whole it's you know it, it's the Yantif, and the Meshachim says, why doesn't the Torah ever spell that out? You have to like go do the math. It, it's if you do the math, right, you could see why that happened. But why doesn't the Torah ever connect the dots and say, you know, the, the 15th of Nisan, that's when we, 
you know, God got out of Egypt and we have a yantif. And then seven days later, we split the sea and we have a yantif. Why, why, didn't, why do we forget? Like, that is what happened. Why doesn't the Torah say So Meshachachma says it, it couldn't say that. The Torah couldn't say that. Because then someone might make the mistake that we were celebrating the death of the Egyptians. It's so like modern, postmodern. It's like wow, you know. And I think it's it's like, what else is the answer to that question? It's such a strong question. Why wouldn't the Why wouldn't the Torah just say it? Like, why else is there a yantif on the seventh day? Like, what happened on that day to make it special? No, it's special because it's yamsuf. It's a big event in the history of the Jewish people. But we can't be explicit about it. We can't be explicit about it because. That, that's not who we are. We, we can celebrate our victories, but we don't celebrate the, the death and destruction of our, of our enemies. He says the same thing about, uh, about Hanukkah. We make the whole thing about the lights and the, and the candles and the oil and the passing reference to you know, how we beat the bad guy. But like, that's not the main thing because that can never be the main thing. That's not, that's not who we are. That's not, uh, uh, that's not what, we're, uh, what we're about. Let me conclude with two last, uh, two last quick pieces before we run out of time. One is, um, one is just fascinating to know. It's a, um, there's, a, there's a lot of halacha in the, uh, the Meshach Chachma, a lot of halacha um, in, his, in his biblical commentary. And, and it's hard because you have to really know the sources that he's quoting and citing. I'll just mention one in passing, which is um, Ovadia Yosef was once asked a question. We actually mentioned this in passing in a shir I gave over the summer on Tisha B'av about the topic of Kaddish. And the question, you know, comes up. I don't want to say all the time. The question comes up, not infrequently. Someone has, let's say, a non-Jewish parent. Someone converted, someone's parents, you know, one is Jewish, one is not Jewish, whatever the case may be. So do you say Kaddish on the death of a non-Jewish parent? Okay, interesting question. Wasn't a Jew who died, but... The person who's living is Jewish, should they say Kaddish? So Vadya Yosef says, yes, it's perfectly appropriate to say, uh, uh, to say Kaddish on the death of a non-Jewish parent. And one of his sources that supports this theory is a, is a source that I have for you in source number eight in Meshachma, who, who creates this uh, you know, halachic argument that a convert, even though halachically speaking, right, we say, uh, you know, Gerish and Iskar Katun Chinola Dami, like a new person, they sever the relationship with their, he says, this severed from one perspective and then from another perspective, it's like, come on, it's your parent, it's your mom, it's your dad, it's your kid. You're not severing that relationship, right? So halakhically speaking, there might be some, you know, disconnect because one person is Jewish and one is not, but you know, on another level, let's say a meta level, so that's the father, that's the son, that's the mom, that's the daughter, whatever the case may be, that relationship is, is intact. The last, uh, the last uh, piece I'll just, uh, I'll just share is a beautiful comment from, uh, from Parsha Shlach. You have it in your source sheet on uh, source number 10. And um, it's, a beautiful, uh, it's a beautiful essay about, uh, about Kalev and what he told the, the, the spies and what he told the, the members of the Jewish people. It's an odd pasuk. The pasuk says, Vayas Kalev is Ha'am El Moshe. Vayomer Alona Alet. And again, very difficult to translate because Kalev says to the people, El Moshe, to Moshe. So the Meshach says, he, he told the Jewish people about Moshe. And his argument was very simple. He says, the people made a terrible mistake because the people had heard, and again, he ties all the Midrashim together from the previous Parsha, from Parshas Balosko, where Eldad and Medad were prophesying in the camp. And Rashi quotes the Midrashic tradition that says, what were they prophesying? They were prophesying, Moshe Mace, Yeshua, Machnis Laaretz read that Moshe, that Moshe is going to die and Yoshua is going to lead us into the Jewish people. And the Jewish people were crestfallen because they thought, how could we go into the land without Moshe, without our fearless leader? And so the Meshachach says, you know what Kaleb was saying? It's not about Moshe, my friends. It never was and it never will be. Alo Nale, it's on us. We're the ones going up. You don't invest in, in uh, you know, in the, it's not about the leader. And he says, the proof is that for 39 years in the middle of the wilderness, the Jewish people weren't uh, behaving the way they were supposed to behave. And as a result of the way the Jewish people behaved, God didn't appear to Moshe. He says, it's not that Moshe is great, so we're great. If we're great, that makes Moshe great. And if not, not. And, and again, 
you know, I'm sorry to keep, uh, you know, beating this drum, but it, it's a profound and creative and original. And it says so much. It's like a, a moral life statement about how civilization works, which is so many like contemporary messages. Like the leader's the leader, but the leader is just the mirror of the people. And if the people are great, a leader is going to be great. And if people are not, you're out of luck. Again, there's exceptions to this rule, but you put your eggs in that basket and say, oh, it's all about motion, that motion. We he says, no, Moshe's going to die and we're going to be just fine. And that's the story of the Jewish people, right? Great leaders coming, but the Jewish people survive. And the Jewish people, alo nale, the Jewish people always go up and the Jewish people always go forward. I hope that this was uh, at least uh, skimming the surface of who the Mesh Chachma was, um, an, amazing, an amazing man. I think you can tell that he's a personal favorite and uh, I come back to him uh, often because uh, there's, so, there's so much richness and so much, uh, so much depth. Um, I'm over time, I apologize, I'm gonna stop here, but I'm gonna stay on, unmute everyone and happy to entertain questions and comments.